Welcome everyone um, to the third session in the webinar series, um, Art, AI and Everything Else. I'm Jonathan Parsons, uh, Artistic Director of Experimenta and your chair for today's webinar. It's now customary in, in Australia to acknowledge country before beginning an event. I'm speaking to you from the unceded lands of the Turbul and Jagera nations, the traditional owners of Brisbane. I'd like to pay my respects to the elders past, present and future. Today's webinar is part of the celebration of 20 years of operation by the Art Centre Nabi in Seoul, who have led explorations of the arts and new technologies in Korea. This webinar series has been co-organised by Art Centre Nabi and the Research Unit for Public Cultures and the Communication City Stream in the Centre of Visual Arts at the University of Melbourne. Today's presentations will discuss the theme Humanising the Machine, Mechanising the Human. The title of today's session reminds me of the prescient comments made last century by the American mathematician and philosopher Norbert Wiener considered to be the founder of cybernetics, who wrote to be successful in this new world, either the engineers must become poets or the poets must become engineers. Within the burgeoning field of art and technology, it is clear that over the past decades, we have witnessed artists taking up both pathways with artists beginning their careers in the sciences before taking up art and those with artist training learning, specific, uh, learning scientific disciplines to support the development of their practice. We also see many artworks that give expression to the contrasting predominant approaches to AI, utopian and dystopian. Australian artist John McCormack leans more towards the utopian, where he sees AI as a collaborator in his artistic practice. And the dystopian for me is captured in Louis-Philippe de Mer's seminal work, Inferno, where audiences are invited to hand over control of their body movements to a robotic exoskeleton strapped to their body. The use of AI in art that emerged in the final decades of the 20th century can broadly be seen in terms of the utopian vision for these technologies. And we see a stronger focus on dystopian visions in the early decades of this century. The rise of dystopian view of AI is perhaps related to the second great enclosure movement as the Australian author Richard Flanagan describes it. The enclosure movement he refers to is the transfer of common property rights in Britain to private property rights. Flanagan says, we are living through a second great enclosure where we have these huge technological machines in the form of social media around us, which are actually enclosing, privatizing and monetizing our very emotions, our soul, our hearts, our fears and our dreams. It is a truism to say no tool is intrinsically good or bad. <clears throat> it's how you use it that matters. And while how we use AI has been dominated in recent years by corporate interests, we are seeing different voices re-emerge to contest the corporate paradigm. In Australia, Professor Genevieve Bell returned from the US to establish in 2017 the 3A Institute, a new research centre at the Australian National University examining how we can ensure a safe, sustainable and responsible AI. An Australian affiliate to the global non-profit organisation RESET was established just last year. RESET's goal is to ensure that the commercial interests of big tech companies are compatible with the values of a robust and resilient democracy. Artists and the organisations that support them will no doubt continue to play a crucial role in asking questions about how we use and may want to use AI as this webinar series demonstrates. You're about to hear from two illustrious speakers and a respondent who will explore approaches to AI in art, and in particular, the value of exploring AI in a non-utilitarian context, and how we may approach the use of this relatively new tool 
in humanities kit bag. After the presentations, there will be time for the audience to ask questions um, of our speakers. And feel free to write your questions as they spring to mind during our presentations in the chat or the QA function. And I'll bring these questions to the attention of our speakers in the second part of this webinar. So I now take great pleasure in introducing our first speaker for today, the founder and director of Arts Centre Nabi, So Yong Ro. Since 2000, the Arts Centre has been instrumental in supporting the development and presentation of media art in Seoul, Korea. In her presentation today, she will draw on this extensive experience with Art Centre Nabi and in the field of AI and art. Please make So Yong Ro very welcome. Okay. okay. Hello, everyone. Hello, everyone. It's nice to be here. And thanks to all the co organizers, sponsors in um, three continents at least. Uh, thanks, uh, you listeners, and um, um, for sharing this um, Saturday afternoon here uh, with us. Um, and um, I, I feel grateful to have this opportunity to share with you what I've been thinking uh, through my 20 years of um, Art Center Navi's journey. Uh, today's topic, my topic is beauty in the machinic age. And I'll start by showing uh, one of our Nabi's um, highlights in our 20 years. Uh, we organized last year uh, Isaiah 2019. Uh, it's an electronic arts festival um, held in Gwangju, Korea. Just last year, it seems like uh, ages ago. Um, I'll start with that um, presentation.
그 중에서도 이제 지역 시민들을 좀 포용하고 세계 각국에서 온 참여자들과 어우러지고 소통하게 하기 위해서 아트 프로그램을 보다 밀도 있게 구성하였습니다. 많은 분들이 좀 다양한 미디어 아트에 대해서 경험해 볼수 있는 기회가 되셨기를 세계 최대 학회라는 명세에 걸맞게 그 내용들이 대단히 수준이 높았고 그리고 전 세계의 과학, 기술, 예술 전문가들이 서로 얼굴을 보면서 경계를 넘는 크로스업을 할수 있었다는 것에 큰 의의를 두고 있습니다. 아이자 2019 행사를 통해 한국의 과학, 예술, 융과학의 역량이 세계적인 수준이라는 것을 알수 있었고 이를 기반으로 앞으로 아시아, 유럽, 미주의 모든 나라와 함께 이 분야를 선조할 수 있다는 것을 보여준 것이 제일 큰 부담입니다. 미술과 인간이 어떻게 같이 살아갈 수 있을까? 이것이 21세기를 사는 어느 우리들에게 당연한 과제라고 생각합니다. 기술을 수용하되 그것에 지배당하지 않고 인간의 존엄성을 지킬 수 있는 그런 그리고 미디어 아트와 같은 예술을 통해서 가니까 How is this meaningful, or interesting, or beautiful? Do we have the language to explain and to understand? Like in Plato's pharmacy, technology is both remedy and poison. 2,500 years ago, people worried over writing. But now, should we worry over digital technology? Well, it seems a little bit too late for that. Now everything is discretized and life is transformed into discrete events. Information, in fact, when we think of it, is a historical substance that has temporal trajectory. But with information discretized, relations as well as temporality are being dissolved and put together at random. We're facing a world where relations, along with information, are being displaced, associated, and dislocated. It is the algorithm that is doing the endless generation and transformation of information in today's infosphere. The textuality is predominantly algorithmic. In the algorithmic world, spearheaded by deep learning technologies, Information becomes logic, as Matteo Pasquinelli pointed out. And logic, quote, is represented as the distribution of weights and thresholds. Instead of theory and determinism, we have emergence and contingency. And the good old Newtonian structure is being replaced by cybernetics that merges biology with computation as in autopoiesis and recursivity. What then is knowledge? With the notion of truth sounding too ancient, we now regard knowledge as embodied in data. And this new knowledge is justified by the machine. But this machine justification is alien to us with increasing, its increasing opacity. In neural networks, what works, work. And there's no theory or explanation of why, um, why one method is superior to the other. Neural networks and the whole connectionist AI regime is about techniques at the end of the day, not on knowledge. With its potent yet opaque approximating techniques at hand. 
should we believe machine over humans when faced with contradictions? Doesn't this lack of epistemology in dataism bother anyone? Welcome to the era of postmedia. What is postmedia? It is a media environment where the portion of machine exceeds that of human in signification. Postmedia is run by search engines, recommendation algorithms, and collabor collaborative filtering, so on, that is by assemblage of algorithms where media objects are dissolved and vanished into database. The Louise and Gattari painted a rather interesting picture of post-media era with their idea of abstract machines. Abstract machines, according to them, are machinic assemblage that consist of material, energy components, semiotic, algorithmic components, biological beings, animals, humans, individual, collective members, mental representations, information, desires, etc. basically all that is related to our lives on Earth and perhaps beyond. These abstract machines transfers over different elements and territorializes. And yet, inherent in these machines exists the tendency to deterritorialize, stemming from the desire for the other, thus heterogenizing the world. This is how, according to Deleuze and Guattari, the world gains expansion, connectivity, complexity, and heterogeneity. This is the ontological transverse, uh, transversality of being. Very original idea, I thought. It seems quite reasonably clear that we are all part of this post-media machines, or black box, as Latour would call it made up of technology, science, human, social institutions, all entangled and intertwined together, where signification occurs increasingly beyond human cognition. Paradoxically, the more science and technology succeed, the more opaque and obscure they become. What about us? What can you say about human condition or identity in this post post-text, post-media world. Have we all become unrecognizable, insignificant, and perhaps irrelevant parts of the machine? This is exactly the question we've been asking through the media art in our 20 years of practice. Here, I want to bring your attention to this uh, sci-fi novel called Blind Sight where the author asks the possibility of human life as discognists in the future. These discognists have superhuman capabilities, but have no consciousness. Watts is really asking whether having consciousness is necessary for intelligence. Consciousness, he says, dampens the efficiency of the system, thus dysfunctional. It is a noise. Perhaps we're better off without it for survival, he posits. Really, what's the meaning of survival then when we do not comprehend any meaning at all? This is my consciousness, of course, that is asking this question. While we are still in the dark as to how consciousness is formed, we can nevertheless imagine a mental model, a model of our mind. And here is one I like, maybe by perhaps one of the last humans before we all became post-humans. Slakam. We start from the imaginary here. Every morning I get up and I'm conscious of the world around me and I in it. This is the phenomenal subjective experience as a sentient and conscious being. It is the eye. An eye meets the other, the symbolic. The symbolic is a transformation of the imagery into coherent strings of formal information, leading to objectivity and knowledge in the third person. It is it, the master structure. 
And yet, the transformation from the imagery to the symbolic is barred, in that subjective experiences cannot all be transferred to the symbolic due to uh, real life uh, limitations, such as our finitude, mortality, and so on. That is, we simply cannot merge with the other. So, in our pursuit of the missing other, we move on to the real. Sometimes, if we get real lucky, we can consummate with the objects of our desire. That's Zhu Sang's. But most of us, most of the time, we're not that lucky. We do not have our desires met or fulfilled. We cannot consummate with the other. Thus, with frustration, our consciousness is intensified. Now we have, um, it seems that we have three choice, choices to go from here. First, keep trying to find that perfect love so that you can live in consuming ecstasy forever. Many people do it. Second, go back to our private cell of self and reflect on what went wrong. But hopefully, we have learned something from this triadic experience. Now we can have a slightly better and more coherent self. But still, there's another option. The third is to take the transcending and aesthetic route. Don't worry, I'm not proposing a pseudo-religion of self-oblivion. On the contrary, aesthetic experience require the presence of self and consciousness. It also requires some deferential attitude seen in many indigenous cultures towards the other, you and thou, making relations with the world in the second person. Here, one keeps the distance of respect and waits till thou speaks to me. This is the world of metaphors and analogies, the world of magic and ministry, uh, mystery, common in poems and in great works of art. Like uh, Martin Buber once said, only when we say you to the world do we perceive its miraculous strangeness and at the same time its potential for intimacy. Perhaps this can uh, opens up the possibility of overcoming the zombie-like state of our consciousness, being part of the machine, whether delusion or of Turing kind. Our redemption may start from taking an aesthetic stance on the prevailing technology. It needs some deliberate steps, though. We, f uh, we first need to refuse to follow what the machine dictates, or to go with the flow or the market. We need to stop and ponder and ask questions as to the nature of technology, not only what it does and what we're doing with it, but also what it can do, or sometimes what it shouldn't do. We need to look at the technology with its full potentialities, perhaps with respect, as we would treat other beings in the world. Some of us might ask technology or the essence of it to speak to us. If we treat it with disinterested respect, it might reward us by revealing its wonders that are not yet exploited by human greed. Humility and curiosity can do great marvels sometimes. That has been the story of media artists whom Navi has encountered in our past 20 years of work in this privileged land of art and technology. Like this one. Artists Shin Sun Baek and Kim Jong Un are showing how machine sees the flowers.
is this beautiful? Thank you very much. Thank you so much, So So Yong. Um, and um, I can now see that you've got 20 more years of work at Arts Centre Nabi, given that um, the technological developments, as we know, are at, in terms of AI, uh, are, are actually at the very early stages of development, um, which a number of our speakers have touched on over the last couple of days with the webinar series. So um, I think there's a really wonderful future for the centre for many years to come in terms of its contribution. So thank you so much for your presentation today. Um, it's my delight to now um, hand over the reins to our second speaker today, Scott Maguire, Professor of Media Art and Communications at the University of Melbourne. Scott will discuss how our relationship with an earlier form of technology may provide insight into how we approach our relationship to AI. Please make Scott very welcome. Hi, everybody. Um, I want to begin by making my acknowledgement to the traditional owners of the country from which I'm speaking, which in my case is the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nations, and I pay my respect to their elders, past, present and emerging. And indeed, I want to pay my respects to First Nations peoples of all the countries from which people are joining this seminar. I want to thank the organisers of the seminar, particularly Soyang and um, Nikos, who driven this idea together over many months. Um, I found the session so far incredibly generative. I'm walking around, I find myself in the days between the seminars buzzing with ideas from what they've been. Um, I've titled my contribution to today's session Pyrotechnics. Um, pyro from Latin but also from the ancient Greek pur meaning fire. Technics, also from Greek technikos or techni, which is a root of both art and technology. Um, so as the title suggests, I'm gonna talk about technology and about fire, about fire as a kind of technology. I'm gonna approach this firstly through the work of the late Bernard Stiegler. Because I think there's a couple of things that are immediately really striking about the way that Stiegler treats the human technology relation. First, he, traces it over a much longer scale than most accounts. Indeed, it's explicitly an evolutionary scale, an evolutionary account. And the second thing is he doesn't see technology as alien to humans. Stiegler's broad contention is that technology is what is co-constitutive of human being. In other words, we evolve from hominids, the family of great apes, into what we come to recognize as human, precisely through our dynamic relation to technology or techniques is the term he uses. And for Stiegler, all techniques are forms of memory. And this is what proves so radical for the trajectory of human life. The example he gives in the 2004 film, The Ister, is a flint, you know, he's interviewed in this film. And a flint's obviously a cutting tool that was used by early humans. But Stiegler argues it's also a memory support it captures the gestures of those who made it and used it. And these signs can later be read and interpreted by archeologists and paleoanthropologists and so on. I think this is very much what Sean Cubitt was talking about the other night as the way in which human labor is captured in technology and machines, often seen as dead labor though. This relation to techniques as both tool and memory support, Stiegler says, that's what makes us human, but it does it in a really peculiar way, a particular way, precisely by taking us outside of ourselves. So this taking outside, what Stiegler calls exteriorization, is what enables the transmission of cross-generational knowledge. So it's through techniques we form what we come to call culture, which is stores of memory, archives. The process of technological exteriorization, such as creating tools, constantly acts back on the inside on human mental processes. And in doing so, it concretizes a distinctively human relationship to time. We've talked a bit about time in the past couple of days. Humans are characterized not only by a distinctive capacity to conserve the past in various ways, retention, but also by their capacity to project forward, protension or imagination. 
And we can see this when Marx discusses what makes human activity, labor, exclusively human. And Satinda Gill brought this up yesterday in her remarks, you know, talking about well, what's the difference between the worst architect and the best bee who can make the beehive. The architect raises the structure and imagination before creating it in reality. In order to create and use even the simplest tool, you have to be able to envisage a temporal sequence. So if you say something like making a flint, you have to be able to plot the steps out to find that rock, to shape it, and then think about how you're gonna use it for cutting and so on. This projection of a sequence of steps towards an imagined end is the basis of what we today call an algorithm. Now we might wanna put Marx's claim of human exclusivity into question in some ways, but I think we need to also recognize the distinctiveness of this way of being. Most animals don't pose the question, who am I, who are we? They don't have to work out what they should do with their life. This is the peculiar freedom and the burden of the human animal. But of course, this kind of distinction between human and animals gets caught up in all those debates over the relation between nature and culture, instinct and consciousness. I think these are all terms that need to be treated with a lot of caution. So we'll park that to the side for now. Um, I could spend a lot longer discussing Stiegler, but what I'm really wanting to do is just bring a couple of things into our view. First, that being human has always meant being in relation to technology. So it's not a new condition we're facing now. But equally, it doesn't mean accepting whatever develops in this space. And the second thing, for Stiegler, unlike for many other philosophers, the relations of human to technics is not an abstract one. It's about the concrete relations of technology that are established in particular historical settings. And this is where he sees a certain kind of danger emerging in modernity. And I think this is what So Young was also talking about. So what's this changing nature of technology? I think one is the speed up of it. For a long time, the processes of technological change were really slow. Major technological ruptures, if we're thinking about this on an evolutionary scale, were thousands of years apart. And this has clearly changed, especially since the industrial revolution and industrial capitalism. And technological development becomes an explicit focus. It's integrated in research and development programs that are directly aligned with profit motives. And this means that the process of innovation accelerates and the periods of stabilization become shorter and shorter until the system seems to be characterized by perpetual rupture. I think this is our present moment. And it creates a real imbalance between the technological and all other domains, the legal, the political, the ethical, the aesthetic. And all these domains now seem to be submitted to an imperative. They're, they're asked to catch up to what's happening with technology. I think a second difference lies in the recent formation of technologies that are explicitly directed towards supporting memory. So in other words, these aren't accidental memory technologies like an object like a flint. They're technologies designed specifically to offer new ways of recording and transmitting human experience. Um, probably the most widely discussed is, of course, writing and the transition from oral to written culture is a major threshold in human civilization, although it's often been theorized in quite problematic ways. But the process I'm referring to is really what explodes from the 19th century when we start to see the deployment of photography, phonography, film, and then in the 20th century with electromagnetic tape, computers and digital databases, and so on. These are what Stiegler calls new tertiary memory techniques or forms of tertiary retention, what we might commonly call media technologies. I won't go into how Stiegler distinguishes tertiary from primary and secondary memory, I think the relevant point is these media technologies give us immense possibilities for trans in, in individuation. In other words, how we pass knowledge between people and also across generations. So they expand those possibilities enormously, but at the same time, they also generate a new capacity to exercise control over human pretension, which is our capacity to project events forward in time. In other words, control over human imagination, over dreams, over desire. 
And this is the real danger that Stiegler sees in contemporary technology. It's not so much the digital networks of computers or so-called AI, artificial intelligence, are dangerous in themselves. But this dynamic evolution of human technology relations might be blocked. And instead of evolving new forms of politics, of law, or of economics, aesthetics, ethics, that would be adequate to the new conditions of digital technology, we might remain trapped in a dead end cycle in which our imagination is industrialized in the form of a digital consumer society. I think this is close to what So Young was just talking about as being zombified. I think we can see this trajectory particularly clearly in the way the internet has evolved from a potentially um, global communication resource into something that's dedicated to data mining its users, or in the way that cities are rapidly being converted into similar kinds of data mining spaces through network sensors and so on. This is some great quote from a tech engineer in Shoshana Zuboff's book, Surveillance Capitalism. Um, and this tech engineer, a bloke I'm presuming, because most of them are, describes AI as a hammer and sensors as really cheap nails. It's an odd kind of mangled metaphor. And he says something like, you realize that every nail you hammer into the dumb world, i.e. the world that's not wired, generates value. In other words, data and money. And he says, what do you do? You start hammering like crazy. You put a nail into everything until someone tells you to stop, but no one is saying stop. And I think this, this really striking idea that the world without this apparatus is done. And then also this failure to set limits to say stop, which means that the world at large is being submitted to this imperative for data capture and analysis. So how do we get out of this danger? At the beginning of this year, um, I'm sure many of you would be aware, Australia experienced catastrophic bushfires. An estimated 17 million hectares were burnt. Um, to give you a sense of the scale, South Korea is about 10 million hectares. The most recent estimate is that about 3 billion animals, excluding insects, were killed. That's the largest loss of life ever recorded on Earth in a single event. Why did this happen? One answer is climate change. Um, higher average temperatures combined with changing rainfall patterns mean the fire season in Australia is becoming longer and more severe. But another more complicated answer relates to changes in the human use of fire as a land management technology. So if you know the Australian landscape, many of the trees and grasses evolved over a long period of time to regenerate in response to being burnt. It's a very dry continent. Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people who have lived in this country for more than 3,000 generations, that's the scientifically proved amount, over 65,000 years, it's probably a lot longer, developed really sophisticated ways of using fire to care for this Australian nature. They learned that regular practices of small cyclical burning created regrowth of grass and shrubs. And this is really useful because it attracts animals that you can hunt, but it also reduces fuel load and especially the connection between ground and canopy. If you create a mosaic of burnt and unburnt country, you're sort of constantly regenerating it. And it means you've got a lot less risk of hot fires. Hot burns like the ones we experienced this year are far more damaging because they destroy the mature trees, they kill more animals because they move faster. They also produce a lot more pollution, including greenhouse gases. European colonization meant that traditional burning practices pretty much stopped in many parts of Australia. So that's 250 odd years ago. This is part of the more general history of exclusion of indigenous peoples from their own land. And the European settler relation to fire in Australia was much more one of fear and avoidance. And so in contemporary Australia, people still commonly talk about fighting fires as if it's a kind of warfare. And firefighting increasingly deploys really sophisticated technology like water bombers, earth moving equipment. Over recent decades, we've started to see a really small gradual resumption of some traditional land management practices. But this recognition is very slow and uneven and remains most limited in the southeastern forest that burnt this year. As I was thinking about my talk, I had the pleasure of watching um, an address given by one of my colleagues at University of Melbourne, 
Michael Sean Fletcher, who's a Wiradjuri man and a geographer. And in his talk, one of the things he showed using satellite imagery was the direct correlation between the worst affected areas in the 2020 bushfires and the absence of traditional land management practices in those areas. So this meant that the bush had changed in those areas and become much more susceptible to burning. The next day I read about research into new techniques to control lightning strikes. I should explain that dry lightning is one of the most common causes of bushfires. And the plan I read about involves analysing meteorological data to determine the probability of dry lightning strikes using artificial intelligence, and then deploying low power lasers, you know, laser lights, to enable the discharge of electrical build up into safe areas. In other words, so that the lightning would discharge, but it wouldn't start a fire. Maybe this is a good idea, but it left me wondering, why are we pursuing this kind of speculative technological solutionism at the same time, we're still largely ignoring the rich stock of knowledge gathered and preserved by indigenous traditional owners about how to live in this country, about how to care for it. So I'm not trying to suggest that this is or should be an either or choice. Burning country is a really complex business. You've got to be able to judge the appropriate time and place to initiate a fire that's not going to run away. Like so-called artificial intelligence, the fire intelligence that traditional owners have is a kind of pattern recognition. It depends on a really intimate and integrated understanding of the vegetation, the animals, the weather patterns, the local conditions. It's a human intelligence in the fullest sense because it's co-evolved with what we think of as nature in the course of living on country. Traditional owners store their fire intelligence in various tertiary retentions, to use Stiegler's expression, stories, songs, performances, artifacts, inscriptions, paintings, but they'll also tell you that this intelligence is stored in the environment, the land itself, if you know how to read it. So I wanna be clear here, I'm not trying to speak for indigenous Australians nor lay claim to their knowledges. My question is, how might we start to bring these quite different intelligences into a better balance with each other? So I think it's really interesting to compare Indigenous use of fire in Australia to what science and technology studies have started to call mutual shaping of human technology relations. You know, the idea that humans shape technologies, but the technology acts back on them. When you think about caring for land through fire. It's a really expanded circuit. It runs not just between humans and technology, but it includes what we call nature. And this nature is not the unpopulated wilderness that's the main trope in modern Western thought, nature without people. It's inhabited nature, or better, cohabited nature. It's nature shared with other species, as well as with the so-called inanimate geographical formations, the land, the patterns of country that indigenous cosmology tells us were made by powerful ancestral beings. Fire is also prominent in Stiegler's account of human technology relations. His major work, Technics and Time, was subtitled The Fault of Epimetheus. Epimetheus's fault is forgetting, and, and this story is another creation story. When the Titans were bringing mortals, humans and animals, into the world, Prometheus was asked to allocate qualities to each animal. Prometheus's twin brother, Epimetheus, begged to do the task. He wanted to take it on. And he duly gave out all the different qualities to the different species. So the gazelle had speed, the lion had strength, and so on. This provided the ecological balance of nature, what Charles Darwin will later re-narrate in terms of competition. But then Epimetheus realised he had forgotten to give man humans, a quality of their own. Since none were left in his basket, Prometheus is forced to steal fire from the workshop of the god Hephaestus and give this to humans. And there are many ways to read this myth. For me, the story crystallises the strangeness of the human, that singular animal that lacked its own distinctive quality for survival, and so is given the gift or the burden of techniques, the capacity for using tools to creating symbols and transmissible culture, for looking forward and backwards in time. For Stiegler, this is why human relations to techniques are always ambiguous. 
they're what he calls pharmacological. So this is the idea that Soyang brought up, the idea of the pharmacon as both poison and remedy. And we come back to the question of, well, what's the way out of the current bind if technology is both the problem and the solution? I don't think it can be just through a different use of digital technology or AI in the sense that we can simply choose to have a good use and not a bad use. Nor is it a matter of simply forgetting technology and appealing to some kind of authentic human essence as if that exists outside of technics. What Stiegel is saying is we're called on to construct a different relation or to compose a different relation between techniques and human being, which is to say we need to develop new forms of law, economics, politics, ethics and aesthetics that are adequate to the digital, that enable us to respond to this challenge, to assume our responsibility in caring for the world we cohabit. And we can talk a lot more about this, but I think it's fundamentally about recognising limits to what we can take from the earth. And this recognition is central to Indigenous Australian cosmology and practice, but it's being lost, it's being forgotten in the worldview of industrial capitalism. How can we think of the role of art in this learning or this relearning? Um, I don't think there's only one role and I'm really hesitant to be prescriptive, but I guess Stiegel is suggesting we shouldn't aim to become anti-technical or anti-calculative if this was even possible. It's more about holding open other ways of knowing the world. And I think this is something that art is good at, maybe what it's uniquely de designed for. And I think the first talk in this series Maya was talking about the capacity of art to produce other perspectives, other temporalities that displace a narrow human centricity, opening other models of causality or consciousness. And we also saw this in Sabine's presentation, the way in which artists are using AI in this sense, providing other models of causality. I think it might also, perhaps as Soyang was suggesting, involve breaking the system, exposing its workings, its assumptions, its limits in developing noise, friction. I'm reminded here that more than 50 years ago, Umberto Eco disputed the fundamental claim of cybernetics to be a higher form of intelligence. You know, this was predicated on its radical reformulation of communication in terms of efficient transmission and the minimization of single signal noise ratio. Echo and argued against this. He said art was in fact the higher intelligence precisely because of its capacity to engage with different, often incommensurable values, scales and systems without needing to reduc reduce them. So that's where I'm going to end my talk. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Scott. Um, I love that you reminded us that these technologies um, have a long lineage in terms of the human relationship with tools that goes back um, eons. And, um, and I think also that um, you started to unpack some of the qualitative differences perhaps with AI from previous technologies while acknowledging that we might be able to learn something from the way we've approached other technologies in the past. Um, and I note that you talk about speed being one of the key points of difference and um, and it occurs to me that um, the, the, this this issue of speed uh, perhaps stops us listening and I think and, and, and I think a lot of people over the last uh, couple of webinars have touched on the issue of listening Maya in particular she stopped the presentation for for a minute for us to to listen which was quite a pro <clears throat> profound moment and um, and I was left wondering, because I could still see her on the screen and I could see on the bookshelf behind her, the Sami flag, which is the uh, First Nations people from uh, far northern Scandinavia and Russia and wondered to what extent her thinking has been influenced by First Nations um, epistemologies, um, just as you have touched on too, Scott. So um, I think I, I, I may pick this up again in the Q&A because it's also reminding me of a work that we've, um, Experimenter is commissioned for its next exhibition, Experimental Life Forms, from uh, a First Nations artist in Australia that picks up many of the themes. So I'll pick that up again uh, in the q and I think. Um, but without further ado, I'm going to hand over the screen to um, our respondent for today, uh, Theo Fahn, who's a postdoctoral research fellow at the Alfred Deakin Institute for Citizenship 
and globalization. Um, she's a feminist STS researcher who analyzes the technologic, oh, now I, I knew I was gonna have trouble with this. Technology, she's say, I can't say it. Um, of gender and race. You're gonna have to say it for me, Theo, um, uh, Theo when you come on. Uh, in AI and algorithmic cultures. So please make her very welcome. Thank you so much, Jonathan. Yeah, I look at the technologization of gender and race in algorithmic cultures, but I think your point around sort of um, uh, noise and the glitch uh, and, and forms of listening, perhaps perhaps repronouncing that, reformulating that might open up new ways for me to do my research. Um, so I'll, like Scott, I'll begin by acknowledging um, but I'm calling to you from the lands of the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nations to, make, to pay my respects to Elders past, present and future. To say that this always was and always will be Aboriginal land and to emphasise that sovereignty was never ceded and is practised on a daily basis. So I've been given the task today to reflect on these two brilliant talks um, and there's so, so much to say, but I'll, I'll try and limit myself to just three points or three main themes. So the first theme or point that I wanted to tease out on this panel on, on humanizing the machine and recognizing the human is the idea of mutuality, reciprocity and co-configuration. As Scott's talk, Jerome Stiegler pointed to, technology has always been co-constitutive co of human being. He focused on fire as a kind of technology and how turning to indigenous knowledges of fire management might now bring forward a different kind of human, a different kind of subject who can more sustainably and ethically live and care for country. But the provocation that I'd like to raise with this is just this, what, what is in it for Aboriginal people? We as settlers now recognise that our ways of managing land have been catastrophic for this country. And now in our moment of vulnerability and desperation, we turn to traditional owners for their help. I'm reminded here of the wonderful work of anthropologist Timothy Neal, who studies the social politics of cultural burning. Neil has written on how Indigenous people's experiences of sharing their knowledge has frequently been negative and exploitative. He writes, if we only seek to engage with Aboriginal peoples who are both eager and able to share what they know, and if we expect that knowledge to fit easily into our ideas of what tradition is, then we are once again in a colonial mindset, maintaining old inequalities and fashioning new ones. He states that the vital questions for non-Indigenous people with an established or new interest in this topic is, what are we trying to achieve in seeking to support cultural burning? Are we the beneficiaries of colonial dispossession, simply trying to make our lifestyles, houses and property safer from the increasingly combustible landscapes that we've created? After everything, are we still looking for help without reciprocity? These questions, I think, help us to foreground the politics of technology that even something as primeval as fire is profoundly shaped by political actors and asymmetries of power. That the mutuality of being with technology that we desire can never be attended to without first attending to ongoing injustices. That is, we cannot have cultural burning without Aboriginal sovereignty and self-determination. We cannot have alternate ways of living and being with AI if we don't also reckon with the profoundly racist, sexist, ableist, colonial and instrumentalist structures that they are currently imbricated within. And this leads me to uh, the second theme that I wanted to tease out today, which is around memory. As Scott mentioned, for Stiegler, Nemo Technologies that is, technologies that have allowed us to exteriorize memory, are pharmacological, a gift that's also a threat, a poison that's also a cure, a form of remembering that conversely engenders a loss of knowledge. Again, I, I stay with Tim Neal here, who has written on fire and memory. Specifically, he notes how baffling it is to read media accounts that assume Aboriginal people's fire knowledge needs rediscovering. 
He looks at the history of cultural burning in institutions and how government agencies have periodically discovered the existence of this knowledge, only to then forget these same moments. He pulls out examples from the 50s, the 60s, the 70s, the early 2000s summer bushfires that swept across Victoria, the 2017 Victorian parliamentary inquiry into fire season preparedness, and most recently the 2020 Royal Commission into natural, International Natural Disaster Arrangements. I'd like to ask if, if thinking of fire as a kind of technology can help us produce new memories, new ways of remembering, or are we simply doomed to be locked into these cycles of amnesia and, and rediscovery? And finally, the last theme I wanted to bring to attention here is, is care. So Scott mentioned uh, the story of Prometheus and Epimetheus, and it reminds me of another AI creation myth that is Mary Shelley's Frankenstein, the subtitle of which is a modern Prometheus. And that is a story that's often interpreted as being about the dangers of science that's pushed too far, the obsessive and ruthless pursuit of knowledge, and, and is taken as a cautionary tale against meddling with the natural order of things. But we can also interpret the story as being about melancholia, a lack of care, the tragedy of bringing life into this world without also seeing to the attendant responsibilities. And this is also interpreted as the tragedy of AI, algorithms brought into this world without responsibility to the kinds of harms that they cause. In So Young's presentation, I think we see that another story is possible. Through her tour of the vast amounts of, of truly spectacular work from the Art Centre Navi over the last 20 years, we can see what is possible when we are dedicated to ongoing and slow and caring practices. So Young notes that machines are alien to us, and what her project shows is, us is that the, the result of what, what can happen when we extend to the other, in this case, the machine other, kindness and hospitality. Here I'm following the philosophy of Derrida. You know, algorithms are quite literally the stranger within, remaking our bodies, our, uh, remaking our relationships with our bodies and ourselves. The philosophical question that is often asked of AI is whether consciousness is necessary for intelligence. But I think the work of, of Art Center Nabi and what So Young has drawn attention to is helps us to shift that question. Instead of is consciousness necessary for intelligence, we can instead ask is intelligence a prerequisite for care? And for me, the answer is always no. And the Arts Centre Nabi shows us the kinds of rewards when we show care to others, to the aliens that are our machines, the kinds of beauty that is possible to perceive when we are open to perceiving the world through the eyes of a stranger. Thank you. I'll leave it there. Finally, Nikos is so young and lovely to see you. And I hope to see you in Korea one day when we're allowed to leave the country. Yes. Yeah, I'll echo everyone's thanks. Thank you. Bye.